Corinthians 3, 2 in the New King James Version. It says, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. God wants you to know that you are his book. You are an open book. Your life is an open book to people that you're glad that you're an open book and to people you're sad that you're an open book. Most of the time, we can stomach ourselves by believing that we are a witness. But most of us are religious witnesses. In other words, we're real good witnesses while we're at church. We're some of the best witnesses God has. And somehow, by the time we get to the parking lot, somebody better not block you or, 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 or back into you. Or you, or you, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Our Christianity is really good during church. But by the time we get home, we take our faith and our Christianity and our discipleship, we put it in a Ziploc bag and we put it in the freezer till the next time we're going to need it. And you couldn't tell us at Walmart from any other Philistine. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. So we have to understand that church is where we fake one another out and we try to fake God out because we raise our hands and we get, you know, we speak, we pray in the King James and, and we're, we're courteous and we don't beat our children and we're not, we don't slap our husbands and our wives in church. We wait till we can do that at home. You know what I'm saying? Are y'all out there? Yes. yes. Okay. I, I, you know, I didn't come to make you happy. Okay. I just want you to know. I, 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 apostolically, I came to stir you up and have you look at yourself. Okay. Now, you don't have to sit under me every week. You have a pastor and a pastorette that loves you just like you are. But I came to push and shove on you a little bit. And I want you to know that you are an open book created by God to be an open book, read and criticized and encouraged by all people. Amen. I want you to just say out loud, I'm going to turn the page, Pastor Mike. Page. All right, that's the name of my message today. I'm not preaching, I'm just teaching. I'm going to kind of go read, I'm going to read 16 verses that they do not have on the screen back there. This is out of the Message Bible. Anytime that you just want to enjoy yourself, get you a good message translation and read it, it makes the uh, religious people mad because they figure if the King James was good enough for Paul, it ought to be good enough for us. Okay. <laughs> Psalm 139, 1 says, God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. Isn't that a scary thought? The people that are with you can be running their mouth and you smiling at them like this. And they have no idea you're wondering when they're going to shut up so you can get, a, you can get back to your life. And you, you just, hi, hey, yeah. And, but, you know, you can't fake God out. He already, God knows what you're thinking. And before you say anything, he already knows what you're about to say and has for a long, long time. You already know what I'm thinking. You know when I leave and when I get back, I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start my first sentence. I look behind me and you're there. Then I look up ahead and you're already there too. Your reassuring presence is coming and going. This is too much, too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit, to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're already there. If I go underground... You're there too. If I flew on the morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. Matter of fact, you're already waiting for me. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. That's kind of scary. They say wisdom is, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and, and we play these games like when we're going to go pray or we're going to do something that we kind of get our ducks in line on how we're going to present the prayer so that we can present ourselves in the best possible light. And he already heard you manipulating your prayer before you even designed it. Matter of fact, he knew you were going to manipulate him. That's a scary thing. It's so much safer to emotionally feel and to be religious because, you see, we figure if we have anything showing, we can just get a bigger fig leaf. Is anybody out there? Okay, all right. 
I'm glad y'all came because you're used to me. So you're going to make some noise no matter what. All right. It's okay. All right. He says, uh, then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It's a fact. Darkness isn't dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're all the same to you. Oh, yes, you shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, you're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation I am. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book. Did I tell you you're an open book? Would you look at somebody and say, you better turn the page. Like an open book, you you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life, all prepared before I even lived my first day. We celebrate our God in the fact that you can see as David is writing how personal he feels like God is with us. Exactly. Remember, we, we go, you, you know, I love God. That, that's, not, that's not a miracle. What's a miracle is that God loves you, okay? Right. Because God has got himself together. We're, 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 we're hooking, crooking, lying, sneaking, manipulating, telling part of the truth, jockeying. You, you know how we are, okay? And, 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 and being two-faced and hypocritical and religious at the same time, it depends on who we're with, with this person or with that person and so on. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he chose to love us with the screwed-up mess that we are. How many people know you can speak in tongues, be filled with the Holy Ghost, be a tithing, pew-jumping, devil-hating, rapture-waiting, tongue-talking Christian, and be all whacked out? Does anybody know that? You could probably be sitting next to somebody that's a spirit-filled, whacked-out person right now, and you only see them on Wednesdays and Sundays, and they didn't fake you out because you don't live with them. But you know the problem they have? They come with them, and they go home with them, and they got to live with them all the time. But God knows their heart. God says we don't even know our own heart. We only know the part that doesn't scare us to death. God would never let us know the truth about ourselves because it would kill us. Because we like to believe that we're somebody that really loves God. We're really committed to God. We're not like them cigarette-sucking Canaanites, them Philistines out there, them whoremongers out there, not us. We go to church. We give our money to God. God can count on us. You see, we have believed our own report. And we don't mind loving God until he crosses us, (laughs) until he disappoints us, until he does something that that, that we we didn't think he would let happen to us. And then God allows you just to see a little bit of how fickle and disloyal you really are. But you know why he doesn't mind that? Because then you get to figure out how much he loves and how great his grace is that he would still jointly let you inherit heaven with Jesus. What a miracle. But God wants a very, very personal relationship with me and with you and with you in the ultimate personal way that God not only wants you to know that he knows you, he wants you to know him in a very intimate way. And I'm talking about not just church. I get to travel a lot and preach a lot of places. And one day uh, God said, you know, Mike, you go to church way more than I do. I said, what? He says, yeah, you go to churches I've never been to. For the slow learners, you'll get it next Tuesday. But some of you understand what I'm talking about. There are churches that he took his candlestick out a long time ago. They didn't even know they had the candlestick in the first place. And they go on with their ritual and they go on, they do what they do. But, 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 but the, there's no, no living Shekinah glory of God in that house. 
God actually knows me and he knows you better than you know yourself. And the problem is, most of us don't want to know ourselves any better than we know. Because we know enough crud and dirt on ourselves to already keep us on the edge of condemnation for the rest of our life. Most of us disqualify our own miracles in life because we knew if I was God, I wouldn't bless you like you are. a little better on this side. <laughs> you might have to move that thing over here, okay? <laughs> now, let's go a little bit further if we can all stand it here. God knows your uniqueness and your bentness. How many people know that no matter how wonderful we are during worship, that we kind of kink towards anger or towards lust or towards fear? or self-pity, or prejudice, we kind of kink. In other words, we don't really need a devil to tempt us. We can screw up our lives by ourselves. No, de no devil necessary. Exactly. And God knows that about us. Now, we try real hard to mask that, and we try real hard, but, you know, God knows that, and then he knows more about it. What God does for Tom and for Mike and Michelle and Elaine is while we're in the mother's womb, he is already creating a body with gifts, talents, and personality and propensities based on before there was a world that he was already thinking about you eternally being rewarded for a temporal purpose that he was going to do. So he not only designs your body to be black as a berry or white as cow's milk, to be six foot two or four foot eleven, to be fat like a cantaloupe or to be skinny like a bean pole. <laughs> he already made you in a body that makes you perfect for your purpose, Amen. for Hallelujah. your eternal reward that you are fearfully and wonderfully yeah. created yeah. to be exactly you. And if you were any taller or any blacker or any whiter or any fatter or any whatever you are, you wouldn't be perfect for your purpose. Right. Let's all say thank you, Jesus, for making me just like you did. Fool you on the world what they think about my body, okay? Because I am perfect for my purpose. Well, we have to understand that not only did God know us before the sperm, did the tango with the ova in the fallopian tube and start us off. We have to understand before there was a world, he was already in love with you. Hallelujah. And he had an eternal purpose yes. for you. Yes. So while you're in the womb, he gives you a body that's perfect for the life he's already designed yes. for you. Yes. He is the author and the finisher of all of your life. To make you, you, now be another, never be another you. No, no one will ever be like you. Exactly. Some yeah. of you have already married a person that you know there'll never be another one like him. <laughs> Some of you have birthed children that you hope to God there'll never be another one like that one. <laughs> Proverbs 5.21 says, For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and God ponders, examines, and he watches and he says, man, I, that's not the way I design you. What are you acting like that for? How many people know, listen, I was 21 years old when I married Elaine. We both got married at, 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 uh, right after we graduated from college. And I was, I, I married, at 21, I married a virgin we were two virgins, and one of the main reasons I did, because when I was about 13 years old, my mom told me that God was watching me all the time. And when I was with a girl on a date, I imagined his eyeballs as big as the moon watching. And, and I got sanctification all over me. Okay. How many people know we'll all do better if we're being watched? That's right. 
Now, you ain't going to screw up if you really believe that God is watching you from the outside and from the inside. People say, well, I didn't say anything wrong, not on the outside, but he who lives on the inside heard you before you said it. Now, why doesn't God slap himself in the head and fall off the stone, the, the throne when he hears us think and say and do what we do? You know why? Because he, he knows that that's just how you are. When David, who is God's friend, had a heart after God, when he committed sin with that, that young girl, God just looked at that and he said, yeah, that's David. Yep. Right. Yeah. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ because before there was a world, God knew if he was going to have a relationship with you, he was going to have to kill Jesus yeah, exactly. because that's the only way he could legally have that kind of relationship with you. I feel like we were on a hayride. We're doing pretty good, and I hit a bump and lost three or four Presbyterians here or something. You know, I, I don't know. God wants people to read your life like an open book. Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 2 again. You are an epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. That's a scary thought. All men are watching your life. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with the ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, on your heart. And whatever is in your heart is displayed in your countenance, in your personality, in your character. God wants us to be not only a book, but an interesting book. Now, Elaine and I... We kind of hate the devil vision. We like to, we work all the time, and we could, I like to sit down with some bluebell and watch the devil vision now and then, but we, we only watch like the old black and white Perry Mason. Some of you young kids don't know about that, but it was an attorney, a, a lawyer, and, and in that show, there's always, they, it comes to a place where it's under tension. Now, the guy has never lost a case, but every night I, I'm afraid this is the one he's going to, he's not going to win this one, okay? And I tell you, Elaine, Elaine, hey, pray, let's pray. Stretch your hands towards the television set. I don't think Perry's going to win tonight. All right, got that? All right. But then God blesses our prayer, and he wins, okay? God wants in the life that he has for you as the author to be an open book read by the people that are around you that has tension, drama, yes. trauma, yeah. victory, excitement, right. sadness, funny. And probably everybody here has had a life like that so far. It's easier to take a life full of drama and trauma and high points and slow points if you understand that you're living the life that God designed for you before there was a created universe to be you and to be a book so that other people can see your relationship with God in the good times and the bad times and for you to be a manual of spirituality on how to trust a God when you can't track him. It's no big thing for me. I, I, I'm, I'm in church all the time, and I churches all over the world, and to see people, they worshiping, and they're loving the Lord, and they're praying, and they're shaking, and they're having a good time. And, hey, that's good, man. We love that. But that ain't really ain't hitting on nothing because at night when you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're crying and you want to quit, you, 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 want to, you, don't, you want to go back to the bottle of cocaine or you just want to give up, you want to get a divorce, you're upset with God. You're mad at the world. When you go, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you can't find God with Sherlock Holmes, a searchlight, and a bloodhound, and he won't show up anywhere. 
God wants people to see your life that no matter how bad the news is at the hospital, you still go. I know in whom I have believed, and I have persuaded he is able to deliver me. And whether he does or not, I worship him. Devil, you can have my money, you can have my health, take my job, but you ain't taking the praise off my lips. God wants to build a life where the people that need to get saved can read you and find it so interesting they want to keep watching. You have to understand, I can deal with the times I had because I read in the book that Thomas had a problem. My God, if Jesus walked through a door to come prove himself, I wouldn't need to stick my hands in a, in, in a hole in the side. They'd have to pick me up off the floor, right? I mean, I mean, my God. I, I mean, this guy had a doubt problem. Well, you know what? I don't have to beat myself to death when I have bouts with doubt because I read Thomas. I, I don't have to beat myself to death and God c- condemned when I get mad at somebody and grab them in the throat during the service because of something they said because I, rem- I can read that, 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 that Moses hit the rock twice. And you know what? I can deal with some sinking times I have when I fall out of faith and need Jesus to reach down because I can read about Peter. And do you know there's a whole host of people that are going to get to heaven because they saw how you related to Christ as an open book and the faithfulness of God and the personal relationship that you had with Christ. I'm glad we go to church. But we can never confuse church and religion for a relationship with the living Christ. And too way too many people do. We need a time clock where people come to church and they punch their card in and put it on the slot. And then when they leave, they take and they punch out. And then they go back living just like every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the world. Please keep the shouts and applause. Throwing your Bibles in the air distracts me. When I, and I, I, then I, I don't know where I am. He is the author and the finisher of the script of the book of your life. Amen. That's Hebrews 12 too. Now, I'm fascinated with women in general because women get to use both this. You know, Elaine is a, an incredible, wonderful witness and minister and everything. And I... I marvel because I'm a man, which means I only get to use one side of my brain at a time. Because men basically uh, use one side, and it's it's to get information to solve problems. Where women have intuition and emotions, and they're all in the the relationship and all this kind of stuff. They don't want a problem fixed. They just want us all to kiss up and kiss together and sing kubaya and and talk about... uh, you know, uh, uh, cesarean scars and all kinds of stuff together and be connected to everybody where men just want to compete and have information to solve a problem, okay? But what I'm amazed about females, I taught fifth grade for several years and I, and, and I hated recess time because all of the kids, hundreds of them would be out on the playground and I noticed that the little girls screaming, screaming, I'm always running around screaming, blood curling, screaming, because they were having a good time. Yeah. Okay? And, and they would scream because Jenny just made the basket. So having a good time. And then Mary's back at school after being sick, and they all scream. Then a snake was on the ground, and they, they screamed. Girls scream the same way if it's happy or it's horrible. It's the same thing. It's amazing how, yeah, it's very confusing. Oh, I, I, you know. Now, when we realize that we can only watch another person's life and that we probably are misunderstanding most of what's going on, with their charisma, their countenance, the words they're saying. Yeah. How you doing? Fine. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, how you doing? Fine. How you? <laughs> okay. Now they're saying they're fine, but their mouth, their face, and their words, and their countenance says that they're lying through their teeth, right? 
But when somebody tells you, fine, how are you? You need to just walk away. Understand that? Why you can still walk, walk away. Because that thing is ready to get you in the jugular vein. You understand that? So we, we, we're hard to read. So what God does is he allows things to happen in your life so that people see over a season who you really are over a season. This doesn't happen a lot, but I try to get engaged couples to wait two years before they get married so that they can see each other through all the seasons, the good times, the bad times, all kinds of issues, instead of putting the ring on their finger, marrying the, the ideal, and waking up with the real. Understand that? Because we can fake one another out because we do a real good job of defrauding our own self. Y'all keep this up, and I ain't coming on the 31st. I can tell you that right now. I got a job. Okay, now. Look at Jeremiah uh, 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Okay. He not only knew him, but he had already, before his mama had a womb, before there was, she was even dating the daddy, he was already a prophet. But God had already written the chapters of his life. That's right. That means in your life. I don't have much of a life. You know, I didn't make anything of myself. I don't get to do anything. I never want anything. You, know, you need to shut up. Let me give you something spiritual. Shut up. Because God was already thinking about you before there was a world. Okay. And he wrote this script. And I don't think he's happy if you don't like the book he wrote. I notice when Elaine will read something, she'll read it, she'll read it, and she goes, ha, ha, you know. And, and, and then she'll read something, she goes, oh. oh, God, you know. Because when we watch a show, a movie, a film, a read a book, we get to a point where we're caught up in it, and then it's so sad. It's so bad. It's so <laughs> That's the, oh, my God. It's like watching Little House in the Prairie. The barn's going to burn down. They're all going to go blind. Week after week after week, it's the same thing. And so if you, if you and I say, now, babe, Turn the page. The next time you look at your life and it looks like a sad story, don't judge that book until you finish it. Turn the page because there's more to come because what you need to know in the Holy Ghost under God's leading, his direction is not necessarily destination. That's right. That's right. So if the road you're on in your life is not looking like it's going anywhere, that's not the issue. Because when eventually you turn enough pages, there was a quick right, and you wound up in the palace. Okay? Look at your neighbor and say, don't judge the book yet. You haven't read it all. And you look at your life and say, man, I can't wait. I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and say, man, I can't wait till tomorrow so I can turn this page. <laughs> I got right. enough of this page. Right. But I got hope for the next chapter. Yes. Okay? Yes. Hallelujah. Now, if you're able to read this long enough and recognize that if you read any good book, that when you get to the end, you find out it says, and we lived happily ever after. So read the book that God has written for your life and understand it's perfect for your temporal purpose and your eternal purpose. Praise the fact that he wrote you out of his mind and spoke you into existence for an eternal purpose. But eventually you're going to find out Romans 8, 28, all things no matter what kind of bad things, twists and turns and disappointments and frustrations and betrayals, whatever happens, that it's eventually going to work 
for God's glory and your eternal good yes. if you can trust a God that you can't trace. Amen. If his eye is on a sparrow, I think he thought about you more than once. It's a great song, but I'm not moved by the fact that he's looking at a bird. I want to know he's watching Mike. Philippians 4, 6 says this. Be anxious and worried and bummed out about nothing, honey. Nothing. Hold your excitement down. I know. <laughs> Most of our lives, we need to just accept this is my life. Thessalonians 5.18 says, And in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus yeah. for my life, not your life. If I really believe that God is a faithful God who knew me before my mom even had me in her womb and already designed for me to be a preacher of righteousness and would, it would have a, way, a path and circumstances, a life design that I had to accomplish my purpose, I can rest in that. Amen. Rather than trying to figure out how life can be taking this kind of a turn in my life? How can God, how can a good God that says he loves me let this happen to me? How can God, you tell me that. I don't know how he calls himself a good God and then he lets this happen to me. And he knows that I just serve him. He knows that I'm a good person that loves him. He knows that I tithe and then he lets this happen to me. Now, I know none of you know what I'm talking about. I, the, the Baptist people feel like that. Okay? <laughs> because the quickest path to peace is acceptance. Come hell or high water, whatever's going on, if you're able to accept the life that you have, that the life you have right now is not the life that you wanted it to be, but it is the life that God allowed you to have for his purpose. Yeah. If you can accept it, it doesn't matter what's going on because this is, happens to be a moment in the mind of God when he was writing a script and you're about to turn the page and you have no idea what's going to happen on the next page. Exactly. Yes. Am I boring y'all too much? Understand I'm going to go through this. I don't know where the clock is, but the pastor here who works for me already told me I can take all the time I want. All right, now watch. The stinger is always in the tail. So I'm doing all this to plow you up for what I feel like the Holy Spirit wanted me to do at the very end. So just bear with me, okay? I don't think uh, Dairy Queen here closes real early, right? Okay. Uh, most of us have what I call more heat than light. Understand, most of us come to Christ not because we saw the light, but because we felt the heat. It's yep. true. How yeah. do you understand that? Yes. Let me say it again. We didn't come to Christ because we had revelation light. We came to Christ because we felt the heat on our behind and we right. ran forward to, get to, to, to solve our problem. Yeah. Most of us live the book that God gave us every day with way more heat than we have light. So we whine and complain and murmur and blame and fret when God wants us to have peace regardless of what's going on. Psalm 25.19 says this. Psalm 25.19. Y'all have that one? It says, see how many enemies I have and how viciously they hate me. Okay, just trust me, okay. Most of you would have to understand that you have people in your life that no matter how wonderful you are, you have people positioned in your life by both the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit that can't stand your guts. They wish you died in your sleep last night. 
And if you don't have some right now, you are an unusual person. Come up here and lay hands on me, spit on me, pray on me, whatever you got to do, because I would like to have your anointing, okay? After a while, you'll find out if you have 100 people that love you, you'll go to bed and eat and wake up in the morning with the one or two who can't stand you. That's what they'll be on your mind the whole time. You have to realize that God wants you to identify with Jesus in the form of anyone who wants to live a godly life must suffer persecution. Therefore, they have to have food stationed in their life. Jesus never called anybody except Judas friend when in the garden because that negative friend caused him to accomplish his purpose going across. Peter, he called the devil because Peter tried to stop him from his purpose. So you have to understand, you have to have negative people in your life. God put the enemy, he put the enemy in your book to cause tension. But you understand that God puts wicked people in your life to channel you to get to the central purpose of your life, and you need to be grateful for them. Revelation doesn't come by study. Revelation comes by divine provision when you need it. The next time you're surrounded by the enemies and you have depression and worry and anxiety, instead of fretting on it and trying to plan how to change this and, and you wish you'd move away from them, you wish they'd move away, you wish it would happen, instead of doing this, pull over to the side and recognize the fact that if you understand you can be the designated driver in the midst of trauma and drama, you can hear from heaven with everybody screaming and throwing chairs and criticizing. You can get a word that will dismantle all the tension yes. in your life. Yes. 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 Exactly. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I'm a God. Uh, Isaiah 30.15 says, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. The NSAB in, 40, in Psalm 46.10 says, Cease from striving and know that there's God. Get your mind off the, off the circus around you and get your mind on the fact that his glory has never left you. The Holy Spirit never left you. And this is part of the story that you're in in that particular chapter. And eventually you're going to turn the page and those people become the non-existent thing and they're not ever having the book again. Because you have to understand that Proverbs 16, 25 says, there is a way that seems right to me, but if I keep it up, the end there is death. That's because your culture only seems right to you. I married a Cajun. My, 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 my culture was New Orleans, Sicilian, Italian. They do things and do things automatically that Italian people didn't do. And... and it was years we were married before Elaine was able to stand the cheese I put on my pasta, okay? Because the culture makes it, this is right for us. When I was in Cambodia, every day they served uh, 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 boiled big black tarantulas every meal. I couldn't stand that. But when I'm in New Orleans, I suck the heads of crawfish and peel the tails. And the people from Wisconsin see that and they throw up, okay? Now, now. Your culture that you have makes you think that you're right in your own eyes to be able to relate the way you relate. When that happens, you have to recognize the fact that you have strongholds in your life, and this is the way it goes. A response to a negative spiritual influence immediately creates an atmosphere. If you keep that atmosphere, like... You feel sorry for yourself, you, or fear, or worry, or anger. That atmosphere, if you keep it, it creates a climate. If you sustain that climate, it creates strongholds in your brain that become more true to you than God's revelation. Your culture then becomes those strongholds, and it creates the perspective of how you see God and life and other people and yourself that's different than the way God does. And that cultural perspective justifies your reactions in life. And so you're not convicted to act like you act like instead of repenting that you're reacting like that. You got to watch your own culture that's between your ears. Now, what we have to do is 
I'm going to make this short. I'm going to slip to this. We're going to have to recognize there are some things in life that we have no control over. Okay. Now, I have a list. First thing is Elaine. No, that's a different list. Okay. Now, watch. How many people already recognize there are people in your life you can't control them? You understand that? Okay. All right. Now, let me give you a quick list. First of all, you can put up Mark eleven twenty four. When I deal with young Christians, especially young pastors, all the time, I have to go through this all the time. They go, yeah, but I don't understand. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty four. Okay. Whatever thing, he says, whatever thing I ask, if I believe I can have it. Yeah, but listen, what you have to understand is you can't control the menu. Let me help you. Uh, they were said they went on they went on vacation, and the oldest boy, ten now, he didn't want to order off the kitty menu, because he's grown. Okay, but when you're a little kid, you can't say I want a lobster and a ribeye. You all, you read it's got beanie weenies, <laughs> it's got chicken wings, and it's got mac and cheese. That's your menu. Because wherever you are in development in the chapter of your book, you ask whatever on the menu that you have. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I have guys under me that have churches, and they want to order off a menu I have. The guy wanted to order a jet because I have a jet, and if I can, he, he believes. I said, son, look on the menu that says coat of paint for the front of your church. You need to order yeah. off the Sherman Williams menu, go. and you can get any color you want. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. So you got to pay attention to the fact that you have to read off the menu. You don't read off the apostolic menu if you're a pastor. You don't read off the, the, the pastoral if you're an evangelist, if you're a missionary. If you're scum we all have different menus. Okay. The second thing that you can't control is the season in your life. You didn't start it. You can't end it. You can't begin you, I, I, don't, I don't like winter, so I'm so, tomorrow I'm having spring. No, 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 you got to be, we tell pregnant women with two little uh, uh, things wetting and pooing and little pampers, you can't be in the ministry right now. Your season is to be a mama to little babies. That's the holiest ministry. Now, when you have them out the way, now you want to be, you want to work in a Sunday school, but you, you're not in, you got to be in the season you're in. So learn to live in the season because you can't control it. Because Ecclesiastes says to everything there's a season and a time. Yeah. Number three, you cannot control what other people think about you. Right. Exactly. I know what she's thinking. No, you don't. Half the time you don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> you're not, he didn't call you to be a mind reader. That's paranoia. That's a devil lying to you. Well, I, I wonder what they're going to think. Hell, it don't matter what they think. It matters what God thinks. Yes. Yeah. Woo. Yes. Hallelujah. Proverbs 21, 2 says, A person may think their own ways are right, but God weighs the heart. There's something with a... Listen, I've never played football in my life. I'll sit down with some guys watching a Saints game. Oh, that coach is an idiot. I, never, I don't even know which end of the football to throw. Both of them are pointed on each side. I don't know, but I can say, oh, I can't believe the coach did that. <laughs> Nobody knows what I'm talking about, right? We know how the president ought to do it, the government, the police, and the sheriff, and that, the school teachers, and the school board, the pastor, we know. <laughs> Number four, you cannot control the crazy people in your life. Say out loud with me, I cannot Control crazy. You can't heal crazy. You can't fix crazy. There's nothing you can do. And there's nobody here that doesn't have at least one person in their own family that could star every show on the Gary Springer show. You got some dysfunctional nuts in your life. At 56 years old, still living in a garage behind mama's house, and you can't keep a job for one in three days. You, you got nuts old people in your family, you do, and you're wearing yourself out 
thinking that you can control crazy. You cannot. Exactly. Proverbs 27, 22 says, if you took a fool and put him in a, in, 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 in a mortar and beat him into a powder, you couldn't separate the fool from his foolishness. The Bible says if you hit a fool in the head a hundred times with a stick, you would have corporal tunnel disease in a hickeyed fool. <laughs> Number five, you can't control the bizarre, weird things that happen to you in your life that happen. You can be a pastor of a full gospel church on Easter Sunday talking about Jesus arising and your commode can overflow while you're at service. These things can happen. Yes, sir. I know a pastor in Toledo who told everybody that comes to visit him, be careful going down my road because the deer running all, you can hit a deer. People hit a deer. And as he was saying that, a deer ran into the side of his car. Wow. He said, I've said, don't hit a deer, and a deer hit me. Okay? <laughs> Things can happen in your life. They come out of nowhere. Matter of fact, he says in 1 Peter, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning all the cock and bull crazy stuff that happened. Right. It happens in life. God doesn't cause you trouble. Life causes you trouble. Yes. The people you marry causes you trouble. <laughs> the families you marry into, the friends you yes. did right by that you didn't know, the, the, the devil. But life does this to you. Yes. Number six, you can't control how and when God answers your prayers. 1 John 5, 14 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, that's the problem. We don't know what his will is. We give, we, we give him our will. This is my will as will and testament. Get it done. God won't sin against you by disrupting the script he wrote for you before that was a you. Uh, yes, indeed. Number seven, you cannot control or be responsible for what other people do to you. You are never responsible for what other people do to you. That's their responsibility. How you respond to whatever was done to you is your responsibility, not theirs. All right, number eight. This is where we come into the end right now. Somebody say amen. Okay. And then some of them say thank God. Okay. You cannot control demonic accusation against you to condemn you in every area of your life. That demonic ring comes constantly. It's called the birds of the air. It flies in your mind. And if you don't know how 2 Corinthians to cast it down, you're going to get condemned. You're going to feel like you're no good. You, 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 you're a bad wife. You're a bad lover. You're not a good mother. You, 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 you don't pray enough. Uh, it, it'll remind you of your history, and it, it'll torment you. There are too many condemned Christians in the church world. Condemnation repeatedly points out failures on how much you messed up, and that you are disqualified from the blessings. Most Christians never see their potential because they disqualify themselves because they allow condemnation to come to them based on a chapter that happened way back when that they've never turned the page on. Tonight I came to do something. I want to move this out of the way real quick. Do y'all have any tissues here? Let me see something. Okay. Okay. I don't know that this is going to work, but I felt like the Lord did. Tim, stand right here. Right there. And Larry, stand right there. Now, have you ever noticed, this is what I do. You're in the bathroom somewhere, and that stuff starts running out your nose. You take it and you blow your nose. And you walk over, and you either throw it in the little basket there, or you throw it in the toilet paper, like you do a dead roach, and you pull a thing, and you watch. And once you did this, and you throw it down, you don't, on the way to work, say, I got to go back to the house. 
and you dig in that trash can and you pull that thing up and you open it up and you start digging that. And then you go, oh, that's nasty. And then you throw it away. Then about four, 3 o'clock that day, you go back and say, you know what? Yeah, that really is nasty. That came out of me? Oh, my God. Look at, if that came out of me, it would be nasty. Now, God gave me a scripture, and we're going to do something, because I believe of all the churches, and I said it a while ago, this church right now is in a season to have a better supernatural move than, than most of my churches right now. Okay. Now, listen. If you listen to me tonight, we can, we can make some ground. This core church right here that's here tonight, God spoke to me. Too many of you are living in condemnation, and you never miss church. You pray, you love Jesus, you believe God, you speak in tongues. But you're disqualifying yourself from the supernatural. Scripture says this, 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear, Paul says, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his deceitfulness, his craftiness, his manipulation, that so your minds can be con corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, I want you to understand, God told me today, I, I don't want any sound, anything. Okay. Just listen to me, because I'm going to tell you what, I, I, let me tell you why. It's not that you don't play well. I, don't, I want everybody to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I don't want any distraction. I'm going to do what I've heard earlier this morning. Now, if you got anything out of everything else I said, that's fine, but it was all just so I could do this. I want you to remember again, as nasty as this seems, if you blow your nose, that, that, that mucus is nasty. We throw it away. We walk away from it. And we never, ever think about it again. God told me that there's some people here tonight that the devil has so reminded you of what you did five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, that whenever you get up to worship, whenever you go to ask God to bring you to another level, whenever you do to please God, the devil is able to blackmail you to disqualify yourself and you back off from it. That I can't be used of God. I can't be blessed of God. Now, I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit if that's one of you. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is do something that's a chapter in your book that you will say, devil, you will never blackmail me against this because the simplicity is I have been washed in the blood and I'm going to remember the day that I took one of these tissues and I took anything that you had against me that was nasty in my life and I blew it out and I'm going to go throw it at the altar and then I'm going to walk back and you will never blackmail me again and I'm going to walk in righteousness and in dignity into the next chapter of my life. Would you stand with me right now? Now, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for the Holy Spirit to speak to hearts, God. Those that know that they've been made to feel less than they are, that they've been condemned because of some kind of sin, something that was done against them or something that they did, something that they have regret for, whatever it is. And that this is the last night that Satan will ever blackmail you again from anything that is in your past. It'll be under the blood, and you're going to make this tangible thing in the natural so God can be released to do something in the supernatural, to shut the mouth of that king and command it, that, that, that lying, condemning devil so that you can bring this church to another level of the supernatural. Who's going to be the first one to come? It's going to take somebody to break the ice here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait a while because I know what I heard this morning. Don't let your, don't let your, 
You can get your deliverance or you can keep your dignity. You want to distance yourself from regret. You want to shut the mouth of that lying, condemning devil. Now, if you need to be at the altar, I, I want you to be free to go. Now we're going to practice for a minute. The scripture says that I am supposed to equip you to do the work of the ministry. This is what I want you to do. We're going to practice. Just like the saints are on the practice field right now, we're practicing. Right now, it's all here. We love each other. We're at church. We're comfortable. We're doing what we're doing. This is what I want you to do. I want you to, to say in a loud voice, Satan! You will never blackmail me again. I, I put you under my feet. You're under my feet. I'm washed in the blood. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, now don't worry about everybody else because they're doing it. Go ahead, practice, because when you leave here, he's going to test you. Say 10. The blood, the blood, the blood. You're under my feet. You're a liar. You're a condemner. I'm washed in the blood. I'm clothed in righteousness. You will never blackmail me again about my past. I have no past. I have one great future. I'm turning the page. I'm turning the page. I'm turning the page. Ho re ma la ma sanda kato. Robo le bakaya. The blood, the blood, the blood. Now, Satan, I bind you. I break every generational curse, every familiar spirit, every stronghold I command. It comes down like the walls of Jericho. I send confusion into the enemy's camp. Release these people. They are the redeemed. They're washed in the blood. They're clothed in righteousness. Their days have been written in the book of life. And they will fulfill it on into eternity. I begin to raise your hands and let's just love God. Thank you for your life. I bless you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord.